Hey guys, it's Brian Altano here with Ian Dallas, uh, and we're playing What Remains of Edith Finch, uh, which is really cool because you made it. <laughs> you made uh, this game. Yeah, not single-handedly. Really? And, and not quickly. You didn't do the but... entire thing just like pixel by pixel yourself, did all the music, did all Certain the Certain pixels I can claim. <laughs> uh, few, but... So this is your company, Giant Sparrow. Yeah. Uh, this game is done now. It's out. You've been working on it for, for quite a long time. Yeah, four and a half years. Four and a half years. How, how much have you changed as a person since this game began? Oh, uh, more than I realize, I'm sure. Uh, like, I feel like I've just been in a cave for the last three years. <laughs> so, you know, the light of the sun, for example, hasn't changed right. me uh, as much as it might have changed other people. Um, you point yeah, to me so... like one of the palest people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're inside of, uh, you know, a, an anechoic... You know, it's, we do it's video games for a living, so this is, this is it. So the presentation of this game, um, how did it come together? It's, it's based sort of around books, right? Yeah, it's based on, um, well, I mean, the, the original idea was the sublime horror of nature. That was kind of like what we wanted to make a game about. And uh, that, that led us to looking at uh, the genre of, of fiction called weird fiction. Uh, people like H.P. Lovecraft, uh, you know, and um, Edgar Allan Poe, and Neil Gaiman, and, and those guys. Uh, mostly guys uh, writing about it, but but a few, few women, and um, you know, like from the 1930s, sort mm -hmm. of this old form of literature, and you know that that led us to doing short stories uh, because a lot of the stuff that I think works really well, like stories about the sublime horror of nature and about being in a universe that's stranger than you can possibly imagine, um, it's hard to keep that going. Sure. You know? uh, so so yeah, we we based on on short stories and then also just you know kind of the idea of stories in general. The way that stories, uh, you know, kind of are inherently uh, murky. Like you don't know for sure what happened. You're just getting, you know, Edith version essentially. Uh, and you know, in the game, you're playing these short stories of, of the different family members and, and finding out how they died. Uh, but it's, you know, there's no point where you get the truth. It's just like Edith's version of it, of her experience of these stories. Oh, and so you're sometimes actually, stories inside stories. So you're consuming these tales kind of secondhand through her, which is, is not necessarily the I truth. The house, yeah, I mean, she's narrating it for you, but she's, you know, deliberately constructing a story. Like, this is her impression of what happened. She doesn't have, like, a shaky VHS camera, you know, mm -hmm. that is ostensibly documenting all of this. So now, just surely on a technical level, uh, this is sort of a, a tremendous leap over your last game, <laughs> Swan, which I really, really enjoyed. But uh, a game that kind of, like, reveled in its minimalism until it eventually... Uh, showed you the world that you were kind of painting little by little. Was it was it difficult to jump into something like this, which is so much more sort of just gigantic in scope? Yeah, and, and I would say, you know, we didn't jump into it. It's more like, you know, we got distracted and fell backwards into it. Uh, you know, it was something that uh, we wanted, you know, we wanted the stories to have a sense of, um, you know, surrealism and abstraction and to be evocative of the emotional states, you know, that were involved. So those ended up being kind of naturally less realistic. Uh, so to balance that, we made the house kind of increasingly more realistic. Uh, we also ended up hiring, uh, midway through development, uh, a lead artist who had come from Call of Duty. Oh, interesting. Yeah, uh, not like necessarily the first person you would think, like, let me, no. you know, find someone for my, you know, bizarre indie <laughs> uh, title. But, uh, you know, he, he came from a more realistic lighting background, and, and he was really interested in uh, lighting in general. And I think that really comes through in the house. He did a fantastic job, uh, you know, lighting these, way, these spaces in a way that feels kind of believable, but also, you know, just a hair beyond uh, what you'd find in the natural world, uh, which was helpful for creating this, you know, kind of mid-ground of, like, it, it, it feels, you know, real, but not... Uh, you know, dull and, and not, you know, quite like it's all there. Sure. And I think that's kind of like a, a running theme for this game because the house is such a central character that was it difficult to, to sort of find the balance between making something that flowed well as a video game house but also felt like believably, you know, livable? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. No, uh, trying to find a, uh, a you know, a, a middle ground there was uh, was something that took a lot of iterations and you know I think in some ways the place where we're most successful is just where we have a chance to uh, have things accumulate uh, there's just a, a level of density that you know kind of magically turns it into something that feels 
uh, you know, that goes from being mundane to being slightly overwhelming. Sure. Uh, you know, so the house, you know, particularly when you're looking around, you know, these spaces with uh, like family, photographs on all the walls, uh, you know, the hope is that it, it kind of goes from being a very civilized space into being something that's, you know, almost like looking at the bark of a tree or, you know, an anthill or, or something that, you know, it's just like there's too, too much children. life. Like right, smile, right. Too many teeth. Uh, yeah, I think your brain starts immediately being like, well, this is a quaint house. And the lighting <laughs> is warm. But then things start tipping me off that things aren't going well, such as like a hundred cans of tuna. Right. Like to me, that's immediately like, Mom sealed up are we playing a hoarder's <laughs> episode? <laughs> like, what's happening here? Yeah, and that, uh, I can't remember if we just triggered the text there or not, but, uh, you know, that the cans of, of uh, salmon actually, you know, come from a story that you'll find, you know, in about an hour and a half from now. Uh, Edith's brother, Lewis, works at Cannery. Uh, so part of what we're doing is also, you know, setting up the stories that you're going to find much later in the game. Oh, interesting. Uh, there are little breadcrumbs then. Yeah, yeah, or exactly. chunks of salmon. So, like, right, yes. Chunks of salmon uh, dripping with possibility <laughs> uh, that we leave lying around the house. Uh, so these peepholes are another example of that, As where, uh, you know, like your very first couple minutes in the house, uh, you know, you can find these little pinpricks of detail, you know, that give you clues about what each of these bedrooms, you know, are, are going to be like. And, you know, it serves kind of two functions where, one, we're sort of foreshadowing, because uh, this game is got a lot in it, uh, you know, we want to tell people a little bit about what they're going to find so that when they find it, you know, it, it's something that feels like it's been prepared. And then we're also at the same time uh, trying to destabilize them a little bit and, you know, make the house feel even more overwhelming uh, than it otherwise would. Like if you hit uh, the options button, you know, you can bring up this pause menu. Oh, wow. And this shows you like all of the family members, uh, you know, we're simultaneously trying to make it understandable that, okay, this is essentially a map you know, of, of this family that you're going to be exploring in these, you know, generations, um, you know, but it, it also, at the same time that it, it makes it understandable, it makes it a little bit overwhelming as well. Right. Uh, because you can see, wow, you know, I just played two stories and I have, you know, all these other stories left to go and you start to think about, you know, the connections between all these stories as well, which you can see in the family tree. Molly now, seemed like a girl I could when you were a kid, did you live in like a weird yeah, house? <laughs> like, did you have like a, like a labyrinthian sort of artsy, bizarro house like this one is? Uh, no, I wish. Uh, I, I lived in a fairly standard uh, two-story house. Uh, I think the strangest thing that ever happened uh, with regards to the house was one day, you know, probably like in middle school. <clears throat> it, you know, it was the summer. I was on break, and uh, it was just me and my sister at home, and we get a knock on the door, passages, and there's a man who, um, I think he had a shirt on, but he was big <laughs> enough that it didn't cover all of him. Right. <laughs> uh, in hindsight, I realized he was completely drunk. I didn't know that at the time, but uh, he was like in his kind of late, late 30s, early 40s, and uh, he told me that he used to live in, that ho in the house. That, like, I'd lived there, you know, for 12 years or whatever at that point. And uh, yeah, he, he told me that uh, the house had burned down, like the yeah, top of it, you know, had been rebuilt great. and it kind of made sense afterwards. Like, oh, right, the first floor does look kind of different. But, you know, it's amazing that you can live in a house for so long and not know the history of it. Right. Because generally, like, you don't meet the people that lived there before you did or the people, you know, before that. And, and even, you know, like one or two steps removed, a lot of that history gets lost. It feels like this was an actual kid's room. So how, how did you guys sort of nail that? Uh, well, I, I think we had uh, a lot of help from our level designer, Chris Bell, who uh, you know, went through all of these rooms several times. Uh, you know, I think it, it generally took about three complete rewrites uh, you know, where you'd sort of keep developing it and you get to a point where you're like, well, we're, we're getting better, but it's, just, it's not quite there yet. And you know, then we just have to start over. We say, right. okay, we learned some things, but we'll, we'll start over. And so that, I mean, that helped a lot with the pathing. So one of the things that's really impressive uh, to me now is looking at this house where things do feel lived in, but at the same time, there's kind of a natural flow that players have so that they don't get frustrated generally. They don't backtrack. They just feel like they're kind of moving through effortlessly. Uh, what we talk about internally is like falling down the rabbit hole right. where we want people to just kind of, you know, move through these stories. Uh, you know, and balancing those things uh, was a lot of work, but one of the things that also ended up being really helpful was just having a lot of time to spend in these rooms uh, in the process of making them. 
So, you know, each of these versions that we do, we'd keep a few things, and the rooms kind of develop this level of clutter and detail. Like, if you, sorry, if you turn left here, uh, and you go back over, and you see, like, right here on the wall, there's this, uh, you know, mural, like a whole other pocket universe right. inside. Uh, there was something that didn't come in until a couple months ago. You know, we've been developing this thing for four and a half years, and Molly's bedroom was one of the first places we started. But it's just like these layers and before that was just a brick wall it was a fine brick wall yep. i think there might have been like a little drawing on it but you know it takes a while to have all these ideas to throw out all these terrible ones um so this is a point where people you know feel like the game has gone home essentially which i understand it's a game about you know like a, a woman coming back to the house she grew up in the pacific northwest yeah. relatively modern times very similar and then you know this is the stage where things change and then People are like, oh, okay, this is not gone home at all. At all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I don't know how many people now are going to be, you know, upset by that. A lot of people love Gone Home. Great game. Uh, you know, this when, when the reviews, doing some different things. When the reviews for Gone Home came in, everyone said, this is a, a perfect game because you never have to turn into a cat. <laughs> So this is this is really going to upset a lot of people. No, this is great. Um, I think that there is uh, there is this weird sort of negative notion we've gotten over the last few years of like what a walking simulator is. And they're mm -hmm. like, well, you don't even get a gun in that game. <laughs> well, well, I mean, maybe you don't need a gun in that game. Like most scenarios, hopefully, don't involve solutions that are gun driven. <laughs> right. So uh, is it is it like were you guys conscious of that while making this game that like immediately some people put this thing in a box, but like. <laughs> How do you get people to go, but like, but hear us out? Like, there's, right, there's, well, there's a story here, there's a, a tale. You know, when you're, you're hitting us four and a half years into this, uh, when we first started, Gone Home hadn't even been announced. Right. You know, this is, I guess Dear Esther was around, that was a thing. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think it's something that we were very conscious of. Uh, you know, the kind of genre of walking simulator as a thing didn't really exist. I mean, there's just, Dear Esther really was the, the thing that, you know, you might have compared it to. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think our goal the whole time had been, like, how do we tell a story about the sublime? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't really, I mean, we weren't thinking about uh, what kind of box people would put it into. But that ended up being actually very helpful because, you know, like I said, a lot of people come in with an expectation and then we're able to, you know, subvert that and yeah. give them this, you know, genuine surprise. Which like, is always a tricky thing to find. Like I've seen, I've seen this game a couple of times now. We've, I've, we've had different segments. You and I talked at PSX last year, um, and I haven't seen any of this stuff just yet. So like, this is the kind of thing where I was like, oh, this is a game where you walk around a house, and it's like, yeah. well, <laughs> not, not always. <laughs> right. Uh, no, this game is, uh, you know, similar to our last game, the Unfinished Swan. Uh, you know, we're trying to change up what the game is uh, pretty frequently, so mm -hmm. that players never get comfortable enough to feel like they understand what's going on and then they can start achieving other goals. I mean, they're always in this kind of beginner's mind of trying to figure out what's going on uh, and then never getting comfortable enough you know, to, uh, to start to try to do anything else, hopefully. Did you guys experiment with the owl controls at all I'm so that you could turn your head 360 degrees? Uh, that did not come up. Really? Uh, no, no, I think originally, you know, maybe it was more of a hawk <laughs> or a bat. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I mean, this has gone through a lot of different versions. Sure. Uh, but, you know, in this case, like, one of the things that worked really well was just taking away a lot of freedom, where you used to be able to uh, move, like, in three dimensions, essentially, like, descent, you know, or, you know, just, like, to be flying around. That's kind of the first idea you might have of what a bird simulator might be like. But because in this game, you are an owl, for you know maybe two minutes depending on how good of an owl you are uh, you know it actually made a lot of sense for us to strip down the controls a bit there sure. so that you have you know this kind of joyful experience of you know a little bit of trying to figure it out and then success you know and then you're you're moving on and mm -hmm. you're not stuck at this point where you're coming to grips with what it means to be an owl and how an owl moves, uh, and you're starting to wonder if maybe you should be able to turn your head around or, or whatever it is. That, uh... This is, uh, that was just a very surreal, bizarre, and brilliant segment. <laughs> <laughs> I like that we're, we're having like a deep conversation about like what it's like to control an owl as yeah. a shark is rolling through uh, a highway. Yeah, there's a lot in this game. Mm -hmm. 
So were you, uh, like, at, at one point, you just, did you decide, like, I want to tell one story that involves it, but I, I want to see how many animals I can do <laughs> uh, I mean, this story was very unusual in that it started with just a central image of actually that shark 30 feet up in a forest falling to the ground. Right. And thinking, like, wow, that would be a really odd moment. Um, that some, I, I don't know, that image just kind of came you know, like leaped out of my mind with nothing else attached to it. Uh, but it felt like it was somehow, you know, in a not obvious way related to this notion of, you know, the sublime and things that are beautiful, but also like kind of hard to understand. And uh, so, yeah, that, in that case, like we just started with this strange image and then worked backwards. And, you know, I, I think the idea of a little girl being very hungry, you know, came in somewhere and then everything else just kind of fell into place. I think that's incredible that, um, I, I don't know if a lot of people really think about game design like that. And <laughs> I think that a lot of people probably go, oh, I want this game where you play as a shark. And then immediately you're like, well, the whole thing's underwater, right? Yeah. And then like that, that goes in that box. But for you to come in and be like, well, we're making this game that's about these like sort of microcosmic stories. But what if there was also like, a shark that fell from the trees, <laughs> and then you figure out a way to weave it in, I think is, is pretty incredible because like, why not, right? Yeah, like, and I, I think a lot of games are much more uh, mechanics driven and sort of convention based, uh, you know, where they're, they're more, uh, more of a dialogue with the games that came before them. Uh, and in this case, you know, we're more about like just a, a feeling and that feeling can take a lot of different forms. You know, if you're making a cover-based shooter, there's a more limited set of forms that that is yeah. going to take, yeah. um, for better or worse. I mean, I think there are a lot of advantages that you get with something that players are familiar with. They can kind of jump over this, you know, um, you know, potential frustration with the controls and then get on to the rest of the game. But for us, that's where we're interested in, you know, keeping players in that place of unknown. What's that feeling like to just be like, I worked on a game for four and a half years, it's out, everyone can play it. Is it just like euphoric? <laughs> like it feels surreal. Like I've, I've put out albums, that's the closest I've come, but like yeah. that's, it's that sort of like release of like, it's done, it's out there. Like how does that, how does that feel? Sure. Uh, well, I think for me, it's, it's primarily sure. relief that we didn't crash the plane. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that uh, there were a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of late nights and a lot of crazy ideas, a lot of really bad ideas. Uh, you know, but we were able to winnow things down into something that, you know, everyone was happy with. And I think when I look around, I also just see, you know, like if you turn to the right there, like that, um, turn, sorry, the left. It, uh, yes, like the uh, right, 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 straight. Yeah, so that whistle there, if you turn right again, look down. Yeah, so that's a whistle. If you get close to it and use the zoom, you can kind of see some details to it. It's incredibly intricate. Uh, that was originally going to be hanging on Molly's bed and you would be able to pick it up and then blow through it. And I think Ben Esposito, uh, the uh, designer who we had, you know, doing these little quick prototypes, uh, did a version where you could like press the triggers and, you know, kind of control your breath and it was going to be this really neat sound interaction. Uh, and that didn't happen, obviously, uh, <laughs> for a very good reason. You know, I think we, we just wanted to put our time elsewhere and we realized, oh, doing a custom animation of that is going to be a whole lot of work that, you know, is better spent elsewhere. And we already have plenty of things in Molly's bedroom, you know, to occupy players. Is, um, it, is, it, is it hard to rein in those little diagonals and deviations? Because, <laughs> I mean, it seems like when you're making a game, you could just all of a sudden be like, uh, well, the, we spent six months on the owl whistle, and I don't know if it's working. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's definitely, as a creative director, like the nightmare that you have led all of these people into a dead end, you know, <laughs> and, and wasted all of their time, you know, and been ambushed, you know, by the forces I of, uh, of you know, shipping. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there are places where you need to spend we that. And, you know, things suck on. for a long, long time. And then there's a moment when it comes together, you know, often when the audio comes in like and amazing. you're like, oh, right. Audio is the thing that makes this, you know, feel responsive. Right. Why, why didn't I do that? And then you're like, oh, yeah, that happened the last time, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lesson that's just hard to learn. There's a perverse joy in people breezing through something that you spent so much time on. Because yep. uh, everybody does play it differently. And it's just kind of amazing, like, oh, yeah, this whole world. Because like, it also, I think, contributes to feeling like after you finish this game, you feel like, wow, there's so many things that I probably missed. Mm -hmm. And 
Probably you did, but a lot of things actually you would have seen because again, uh, Chris Bell, our level yeah, designer, is very good at his job his and you know put things in just the right places so that people are, are going to see it. But it once you get a level of density, great. there's this feeling of missing out that is like a, actually kind of a nice feeling at the end of this. That it's a world that feels a little bit larger and stranger than you know you can come to grips with at least you know in one playthrough. So Ian, this game is out now. Uh, where can people play it? Uh, they can play it on Steam or on PlayStation 4. Awesome. Uh, congrats on the launch. Congrats on four and a half years of hard work cum culminating into something so original Here's and beautiful and cool. Thank you. Uh, and thank you so much for coming up at noon. It's oh, good to see you again, man. My pleasure. Good to and see you. We'll have to do this again in four and a half years. <laughs> I was going to say it. You said it. Uh, hopefully sooner, but um, take your time, man. These things are very hard. Thank you so much for coming by. And thank, thank you. you guys for watching.